Hello class, this is week three, chapter three, and this is once again Amelia Gunn's slides on chapter three. Chapter three is in many ways easier than chapter two, um, but it introduces a number of new concepts. So I think you'll find it less intense, but still uh, maybe deceptively simple. Uh, we're going to be covering four major concepts, parameters, uh, methods that return values, and also uh, an introduction to using items from the Java libraries. Uh, third thing is string objects, and fourth is what I call standard in, or interactive methods and scanner objects. Okay, so let's start with parameters. Now this is all review from CSC 110 in your Python experience for most of you, so I'm going to go through it fairly fast, uh, just talking about new terminology. So of course, parameters allow us to um, customize something. So for example, a Space Needle project that we worked on, by using a parameter we could decide how big the Space Needle was. So here we have an example of a method that takes a parameter, again similar to what you saw in Python except we need have some new syntax here. So in the, the, uh, the, the declaration of the function here, there is what we call a formal parameter here. Oh, actually, I think that's on the next slide. So this slide just shows that we can draw write a function with a, a parameter, and that can control how big something is. OK, here we go get to the formal and the actuals. So the formals are what are in the declaration here, so int number, that's a formal, whereas the actuals are the things that you actually pass in. It's important that you don't actually declare the type in the uh, when you're passing in the actuals, okay? You're just going to pass in an expression. Here we see a function draw box of stars that takes two different parameters. These, uh, these formals here and um, what it's going to do is it's going to draw a box of the rows and columns size here. And once again, I would say don't use variables like i and j because it gets confusing. I would use rows and columns. Uh, it's important to note that the, the parameters that are being passed in here, these names have nothing to do with whatever names you might be using in the function that calls this. Um, these are just placeholders. They're really local variables that could have easily, just as easily been defined here inside the body of the function. So when this is called, in the first case, draw a box of stars with parameters 3 and 5, those are filled into these two spaces here for number 1 and number 2. And then this outer loop loops over the number of rows, and this inner loop runs over the number of columns. And again, instead of calling these number one and number two, why not call it <laughs> rows? You might have to call it rows uh, uh, parameter and columns parameter or something. You have to have it make it different than your loop variables, of course. Let's go to the next slide. Now, as I mentioned, the parameters of a function are really local variables. When you return from a function, those variables have nothing to do with the, the place where you called them from. Let's take a look at an example here. So here we have the main function here, and it's calling um, test scope here, and then it's printing a couple of values. Test scope takes this value, and then it prints it out. It, it adds 10 to the value, and it prints it out again. But this has nothing to do um, this is the value that you're passing in, and this modification has nothing to do with the variables that are over here. So in this case, we passed in 5. Inside the method, it became 15, but when we returned, it's still 5. This value outside, outside value is still 5. Okay, this is just the formal def definitions of how you pass in the parameters. Parameters versus constants. You always want to be using parameters. The thing that we called a class constant from last week was just kind of a placeholder until we learned about parameters. Overloading of methods. So this is something that's um, new from if you're just familiar with C. So overloading allows you to have the same named method with different numbers and types of parameters. 
So in C, if you have a function that takes, um, it draws a box, and maybe you have a square box, and C only takes one parameter, and you want to have another uh, version of that that takes two parameters for rows and columns, you have to create two separate functions. And um, that's actually the way Excel is written. It's written in straight C, and there's a lot of there's a lot of cases where we have kind of fake parameters that aren't really used in some cases. If in C++ or Java, we would have done it with overloading of methods. Another uh, typical example of overloading is, is the print statement. So you can supply print with an integer, with a double, with a string. That's done by overloading print into having those different types of parameters. Uh, we call the method signature the numbers and types of the parameters. Uh, I don't think you really need about to know, but <laughs> don't need to know this very closely right now. It will be important later when we talk about more about object-oriented programming in uh, CS143. Okay, we need to talk about returning values. Uh, most all the time, you're going to be returning values from your functions. So let's take a look at the format of this. So We've done a lot of these things where you had to memorize what they did. It was usually a public static void. Well, now we learn that that void is really the return. When there's nothing to return, we call it void. But when there is something to return, like double here, that's where we put what the value of the return is. At this point, we're going to be talking about how to use uh, other libraries. So when there's another class that you want to call, and the example here is the math class we'll be using a lot of. Whenever you want to use a method from an, another class, you need to have the class name dot element. So here, math dot square root is the call. And, um, and it doesn't mention it here, but usually you have to import. You have to have an import statement to be able to use any external classes. Here's a number of important math class items. The book has a more extensive list of these. You're going to be using quite a few of these. Here's a code example of using a return value. So we've got a function here, turns an int, function is named sum, and it returns this Gauss's formula. And here we do, um, we call sum with 10, we take the return value and we assign it somewhere. Uh, this mentions here that it's an error to not use the return value. It's not actually an error. It's not going to stop your program from compiling. It's just not very good form. Probably get a warning or something. Okay, um, we really aren't really talking too much about object-oriented programming yet, uh, but it is true that string is an object that all uh, classes are really blueprints. You take a, a class, you have to create an actual item from a class. and um, the first example of a class is going to be string, which is a really funny kind of class because it's different than all other classes. When we define string, we just say, we just declare a string and then we assign it. That's different than every other object um, that you'll be learning about. So it is, a, it is an object, but it's, it's a different kind of object. Now the way that string is like every other object is that you use the dot notation to call its method, so string.length. This is going to be similar to how you used it in Python, but by comparison in C, you would call a, a static function of, of strlen on the string, and so it's a different, it's a different format. But this is how we use object-oriented uh, code here. We take the, uh, the object, dot, and then the method. Okay, so again, this should be familiar to you in uh, if you've used Python before, and this is the same as it is in C. Characters are accessed basically by an array. It's a zero-based array. Uh, the big difference between Python and Java is that you cannot directly index it like an array. So in Java, you could just say string open square bracket and then give an index. You can't do that in Java. They want you to actually use uh, a function to access everything. So it's zero based. The length of this is five, but the characters are zero, one, two, three, and four for the indices. This is just a bigger example of a string. Again, it's zero indexed. The uh, care at six. So this is what I was saying. You can't just use these kind of brackets and stick it after my string. 
you need to use dot care at and then the element index six is actually the seventh character in here because it's zero based so again this is all what you already know this is an example of a loop looping over the string and getting the the index of each character you're here using care at but i also want to point it out uh, that this is a very bad example i've mentioned this before so my string dot length is a function and depending on your compiler and the code this may or may not be optimized so the problem is that every time we go through this this loop here this may or may not be actually called and evaluated it actually depends on the compiler and what the compile how smart the compiler is most compilers will look at this and say that my string is fixed here and it never changes but if i added just one line in here that possibly added to the length of my string the behavior, the, the efficiency of this function would totally change because now every time that it goes through the loop, it has to determine the length. And how do you determine the length of a string? You have to walk down the entire string. So it becomes a very inefficient operation whenever possible, and it is possible in this case. I would suggest that you start out with i equals my string dot length, and then you decrement the, the counter, and as long as i is greater than zero, if you do it that way, it's always going to be at least as efficient and likely much more efficient. Um, in general, strings in Java, they're kind of magical, but there's some huge performance problems that are hidden from you. Uh, that If you programmed in C, you would see immediately just how much work it is to do some of this stuff. By the way, everything I just mentioned about efficiency, that's not something that I'm going to be putting on tests or whatnot, but I know a number of you are interested in going into computer science and being professional computer programmers, and that is a very important thing for you to learn going forward. Okay, so in uh, Python, you guys had a slice function with the colon, and this is basically exactly the same thing, substring. 0 to 7 is the same as taking a slice of 0, colon 7. It works the same way where you can take a substring 0, 7, and a substring 7 to 15, and it will add the whole string up. This is exclusive here, so it's going to go from index 0 up through just before index 7. So it only prints out compute here, not computer. But you should be familiar with that. This just points out that if you take a substring of something that's that doesn't exist, that's too big, then you're going to get an error, of course. Here's a list of commonly used string functions, and the book has a much more extensive list, and there actually is an even more extensive list that is actually available to you. Okay, the immutability of strings. This is uh, another important thing. I believe strings are immutable in Python, but in C they are not. And this starts to get into why C is so much more efficient. Um, I actually looked up the rules for, or, or the rationale for why strings are immutable. It has to do with security uh, as well as some performance gains. But overall, I would say that it's, it's a huge per, uh, efficiency uh, problem that people don't realize. Um, so strings are immutable, which means that when you want to do something like two uppercase and two lowercase, it actually is going to generate a whole new string and return it to you. And um, that's another reason why this, the, the immutability of strings can be very expensive. If you're trying to add a space to a string in a loop, for example, that's an extremely expensive operation because the, you have to throw away the old string, add a new, build a new string with just one more character, and then stick it in and repeat. So try to avoid that. Okay, so that's the end of strings. Now we're moving on to, I think it was the third of the topics, or actually we're at the fourth of the topics, interactive programs. So interactive programs in, in C, we would call this just standard in. How are you going to get console input? So we've already used system.out to print. Similarly, system.in lets us type things into the console. And we use uh, what we're going to call scanner objects in order to be able to do that. So a scanner object has to be constructed by calling new. I was mentioning earlier how string, we don't use new string uh, like this, but we do use it for all other objects. So scanner is the type. Console is the variable name that you're providing. New is the reserved keyword that you call on an on a, a, a class. So this is the scanner class with a capital S.
And then system.in is just like system.out. It's a special thing in the system that tells it it wants to use the console input. So this is the format for how you create a scanner object. And now we're going to talk about how you use a scanner object. So here's several of the most common methods that you'll be using for scanner objects to get the input. So when I call next on the scanner, it's going to read and return the next token as a string. The next double is going to grab it as a double, as an int, or as a whole line. And it will sit there and wait until the user hits enter. Here's some examples of, on the left-hand side here, you see what the user types in, and the right hand is what comes through the scanner. Um, so this gives you one token for hello, how are you? It's going to break it up based on white space. So here's white space, white space. So it's how are you, with the question mark being included. Black and white, because these are dashes and not white space, that's going to be all one token, and the cat is another token. Here's an example of calling the um, console would have to be a new scanner and calling it with next double twice to get two doubles out of the input. Here's an example where he's um, using um, getting the next int, but if you type a double, that's going to throw an exception. Okay, here's a sample interactive program. This is a pretty prototypical program here. Again, so we have to create a scanner variable. This is, it doesn't always have to say console. It can be whatever name you want for a local variable. You're going to create a new scanner with system.in. It always does have to be system in. And then you print out what you want to prompt the user with, enter rectangle length. Then you get the next double by calling next double on it. And then you again prompt and you get the next double and then you can use that. And that's pretty much all there is to scanners. So to review, what we learned about is parameters. We talked about the formals and the declaration of the function and the actuals that you pass in. We also talked about how you return parameters. We talked about um, using external classes, such as the math class. You have to, to use an import statement. Then we talked about objects, in particular the string object, and how it's slightly different than all other objects. Uh, we talked about classes in general and how you have to create, create a new object by calling new. And we talked about, lastly, the scanner object, how you, you typically prompt and then use next something or other to get input from your standard input. So there's a lot of new concepts in here, but the assignment this week should be fairly straightforward and fairly quick. There's not a lot of uh, difficult computations that have to be made. It's mainly learning about how to handle the strings and the scanners and passing arguments back and forth. So I hope you will find this week to be a little bit easier than last week. Thanks very much.